now each of you will have three minutes as an introduction. Uh, and, and Mr. Tony, you go first. Okay, thank you. I just want to tell everybody right now I'm a pretty proud country boy. Okay, that everybody come here to listen to me and Don talk, and uh, we both should be very extreme and proud right now. But guys, I'm just a country boy that loves whitetails. And I started out a long time ago wanting to just do one thing, shoot big bucks and help people along the way. And uh, it's hard to believe that 35 years ago I was talking to people like Gordon Whittington, Stan Potts, true legends. And I was explaining my deer beds and stuff to them guys. And they said, Tony, you will change the way deer are managed and hunted forever. And I have. And yet, I'm still just a country boy, and I love doing what I do. And I don't need three minutes because what I want to do is get right into the questions and show you guys how to set your properties up. So thank you very much. Mr. Don. Thank you. I uh, appreciate the opportunity this evening. And, you know, this is supposed to have the format of a presidential debate. So right out of the gate, I got to get something clear with Tony and ask Tony a question. Um, Tony, would it be all right this evening if I play the part of Donald Trump and you take Joe Biden? I don't think so. <laughs> I, I didn't think that would go over too well. But, uh, no, like Tony said, I, I'm just a simple country boy as well. Um, I, I shot my first buck back on November 16th, 1979. And I was 16 years old, and as a kid growing up, I was just crazy about the outdoors. And... Uh, you know, I hunted and fished and trapped for everything there was a season for. But on that November morning back in 1979, I shot my first whitetail. It was a nine-point buck. And when I walked up on that buck, my whole life changed. And within a few years, by the time I was in my early 20s, I'd given up all other outdoor pursuits just to focus on hunting whitetails. And, uh, you know, God put a passionate fire in my heart that morning for whitetails. And with each passing season, that fire just... Uh, burns hotter and hotter. Um, land management became a, uh, a passion of mine about 30 years ago uh, when my wife and I bought my grandparents' farm after they passed. And, uh, you know, a lot of what I share is lessons I learned along the way, lessons I learned the hard way through failure. So uh, I just appreciate everyone that took the time to come out tonight to see Tony and I. Um, we're going to probably butt heads before this thing's over, but uh, I have a, a ton of respect for this man. He is actually a pioneer that, that started this whole uh, whitetail consulting craze, if you will. He paved the way for someone like me to chase my dreams, and uh, I have more respect uh, for him than you know. Okay, we will uh, delve into our first segment. It is called Hunting Strategies. There's five questions in this segment. You will have two minutes to answer the question, and you will have an extra minute of remarks if you so wish. Um, the first question is directed towards Tony. You have a video on the internet stating that during the pre-rut, hunting scrapes is the easiest way to pattern and kill a big buck. Explain why it is so important to enhance the number of scrapes by adding to the natural scrapes with mock scrapes and what, does, and what this does to a mature buck's movement. Basically, guys, the weirdest way to explain it is a good old male dog in a park. A male dog goes through the park and the first dog that pees on a bush guarantees every other male to pee on it. Deer are simply going to licking branches. It's how they communicate. And this is how they travel. So if you have a line of scrapes on a fence row and the other one you cut every scrape off, the bucks will all walk down the side with the licking branch because it's the way they communicate. So the more you have that buck, all night long he is moving around working scrapes. Your best thing is to have your place a social hub. And the more scrapes you put on the property, the more all the bucks want to hang out on your property. So the thing I'm always telling everybody, you cannot have too many scrapes. Now there's people out there that says, well, you want to make them more, more uh, important, so only have a couple of them. Guys, he's making scrapes all night, and the biggest, toughest thing to do is to keep the buck off your neighbor. If he only makes one and two on your property, that means the rest of the day he's on somebody else's. I'm greedy. 
I'm making sure he's got all he needs on my property. That's how I grow big bucks on a little property. Scrapes. It's the easiest and the best way to pattern a big buck, in my opinion. Okay, Don, you are not a fan of mock scrapes. Uh, this is such a popular method with brackets and poles and all sorts of products available to help with making more and easier to achieve mock scrapes. Why have you not utilized this tr strategic method of killing big bucks? Well, actually, I do utilize rope scrapes, which is a form of a mock scrape. Um, I, I actually don't, don't disagree with a lot of what Tony said. Um, I don't think that you can hold a buck on a small property 24 hours a day, but what I want to do is try to keep him there as many daylight hours as possible. Um, and if you can do that, you can, you can move him on to older age classes uh, by, by allowing him to survive. I do agree 100% that in the pre-rut, hunting scrapes is a fantastic way to kill the biggest buck in an area. Do any of you have anything to add? I just will say to keep a buck on a small property, guys, it's as simple as this. You have to just make your property a ton of small areas. You can't have a buck walk into a field and look at five, ten acres. You need him to be in a maze. And even the way, and this will be later, even the way a field is designed will tell how many fawns are born and how long a buck will stay in that. So I'm just here later on. We'll get into that in detail. Okay. The next question, did you have a remark, Don? Yeah. I, I didn't see your hand. I, actually, I, I take a total opposite approach to, to what Tony just said there. I, I am a big fan of fewer but bigger food plots. Um, I, I don't want a buck to get out of his bed in the afternoon and have too many options of where he could go. I don't want him to have 20 scrapes he can go check out. I don't want him to have five food plots he can go check out. We're, we're going to get to that in a little bit. So Okay. Um, do, dual question for, for Don going first. Okay. Um, there are strong opinions behind hunting according to moon phase. The belief is that the entire rut is based on the rutting moon, which is an annual full moon, and also that deer movement in general is directly affected by moon phase. Please share your opinions on this idea. Well, without a doubt, a moon has uh, uh, some effect. Uh, the moon causes the ocean tides to rise and fall. Uh, my daughter here in the front row uh, was an emergency room nurse for a while, and she'll tell you when the moon's full, the idiots come out and do stupid things and get hurt. So uh, <laughs> the moon does have some effect. Um, however, without a doubt, weather trumps everything. Weather trumps the moon. I think the, the deer hunting community has overplayed the effect that the moon has on deer movement especially during the rut. I do not believe that the, the moon affects the timing of the rut. For 25 years, I had a captive herd of research whitetails, and those fawns were born the same time every spring, which means the does were bred the same time every fall. Um, I think a lot of times in the hunting industry, people come up with crazy theories. They're trying to make themselves smarter than everybody else. And most of the time, if you pay attention, the people that come up with these ideas do not have the bucks on the wall to back it up. Okay, Tony, do you wish to read the question? The question was on the moon, the rutting moon. Yeah. Basically, I kind of agree with Don. I don't put big faith in it. There is something to the moon phase. But here's what I don't want. If you have Saturday off and you worked all week long and you're using a moon chart and it says Saturday ain't good, you already lost the best day of your hunting because in your mind you will not be half the man. I always tell everybody when I go hunting, I believe every day I'm going to shoot a big buck and my glass is always full. And I, like he just said, weather fronts is my favorite thing. I see a cold snap coming in, I'm going to make my move. I never hunt an upswing in temperature. I wait for cold fronts and usually I can have my buck done in two to three days a year. I'll have my buck harvest by watching cold fronts and basically getting the deer patterned to come past my stands with many of the things I do. Mock scrapes are one of them, but I don't put lure. Guys, I'm a guy that is just gets everything ready for them, and I don't use it. So, so the consensus on both of you is that weather trumps the moon phase in both of your opinions. I would Absolutely. agree. Absolutely. Me too. Okay, we're moving to question three. 
and, and the hunting strategies. Tony will be going first. Don has openly stated that he only hunts on the very edges of his property. I understand that you do not use this same strategy, yet you have advised in a video that the wind always dictates where you sit. On 52 acres, how is it possible to let the wind decide where you hunt and not only hunt the very perimeter of your property, never blowing scent into cover or food? I'm probably one of the most unique individuals you'll ever see set up a property. So guys, I dig ditches so my scent will blow into a ditch and stop the deer from being able to go in that area. I've dug ponds so when I'm hunting, my southwest wind blows over a pond. I use the river so my scent blows down the waterway. There's always a way to use land features to basically get the deer to go the way you want. And then the other thing is, I am one of the biggest fanatics. I eat alfalfa tablets, chlorophyll tablets, starting literally 30 days plus before season, and then I use carbon, and I do extreme stuff to make sure I do not have an odor, and I still play the wind, and I build my property so the stand, and what I'm different than anybody else that I know of, I pick stand locations first, and then I design the property around the stand. I don't care where the deer runs were before. I redesign everything to make the stand be in the perfect spot. You spend a lifetime of setting your property up like that, and all your stands are going to be right on the money every time you go to them. So you're saying you can set up a property to allow you to enter into it more with using ditches, rivers. Yes. And then the other thing is I do not hunt part days. I go in two hours before daylight, it ain't for everybody, and I never leave the stand until dark. No matter if I harvest a deer, I do not climb out of that stand. I take all my deer out in the dark, and that's another reason I can get into stands, why the deer are still in their nighttime bedding area in the big fields. I slip in past them, get into position, and now I can hunt them all day, and they come back to their bedding area. They don't believe anyone could be there. I've already been there, and I'm waiting for them. Okay, Don, in, two th in July 2019, you had a seminar in northern Indiana. In this seminar, you made a remark somewhere along these lines. I hunt the very perimeter of my property, and I let the deer have the center, and every now and then a big buck makes the mistake of traveling too close to my stand site and gives me a shot. Some people say edge hunting is not a good strategy and that you need to get right in next to his bedding area. How can you have success by hunting only the extreme perimeter of your property? Well, I'm probably the most conservative deer hunter that you'll ever meet as far as putting pressure on a property. Uh, the deer that on my place don't even know they're being hunted. They almost think they're in a park-like setting, a state park, for example, where no hunting is allowed. You drive through there in the middle of the day and you see deer feeding right along the side of the road. I've tried to recreate that environment, if you will, on my property. The deer move more freely during the daylight hours. And as I'm hunting those edges, at some point during the season, the buck I'm after is gonna move past me. I'm always hunting the wind. I know how the bucks move on my property with different wind directions. Um, believe it or not, you know, I've been hunting about 45 years now. I hunt less today than I ever have in my life. I've got that property figured out. I let the deer feel comfortable, let them think that they're not even being hunted. They move more in daylight. Boom, when the time is right, I move into select stands and get them killed. Would you agree with Tony that you can use terrain and rivers and ditches and stuff to, to mask scent to sneak in there? Yeah, absolutely. You know, as I listened to him explain his strategy, it makes, it's totally different than mine, but it makes absolute perfect sense. I'm not a guy that's, that's got the patience, to be honest, to sit in a stand all day long like Tony does. Um, so, you know, his scenario would probably not fit so well for me. But, uh, you know, it, I guess you could say our, our strategies fit our personalities and our hunting styles. I just like to say that I am an aggressive type hunter, and I, me, it, I'm going to tell you how I, I, I help everybody. I talk to hunters. A long time ago, I learned something about me. I'm one of these guys that have more momentum, more energy than anyone I've ever met. 
But I realize that's a gift. Not everyone has that. So the thing I have to do is get a hunter to hunt just a few days and give me 110% because what happens, each time he goes out, he's not the man he used to be. He's, he takes shortcuts. So the quicker I can get a guy to give me 110% on the right cold front and everything's set up, he gets in there like me, two to three days every year, my buck is dead, I'm out of there. And that's what I'm trying to teach people instead of hunting 20 times partial and you're leaving too much scent and you're not the same type of hunter after 10 days of hunting. Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll get into that later too. Um, yep. We're going to move to a next question. Uh, Don, you have been bombarded with accusations. You hear uh, you are hunting in the best area in the Midwest in Illinois. You're illegally taking giant bucks by trespassing. You're turning captive does with superior genetics into your property. Have you, in fact, turned superior genetic does into your hunting area? And is this the reason that you have two 200-inch bucks on this stage tonight? This is the setup question I've been waiting for. <laughs> and I was hoping you would hit this topic. Yeah, absolutely not, first of all. Second of all, the notion does not even make sense. Um, my top six bucks were killed on five different properties. So to believe that I'm turning loose captive deer means that I'm going, and, and they also came from five different properties in three different counties. So to believe such nonsense, you would have to think that I'm driving all over three counties turning loose pinned deer. Makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. Here's something else that doesn't make sense. I shot my first 200-inch buck in 2004, and I strived to kill a second one for 13 years. 13 years, I put the time, the effort, the money in, into chasing the next 200, and I wanted to do it on video. If, if I was turning loose pinned deer, do you think it would take me 13 years to get that done? The people that start these rumors are, are people that are chasing guys like Tony and I. They are below us. You never get criticized by someone that's, that's above you. I mean, Tony and I don't criticize each other. It's the little chihuahua dog nipping at your heels. That's, that's the person that, that's going to criticize you. And that's exactly what's going on here. I, I can trace that rumor back to two consultants that don't do 10% of the properties that either one of us do. And they, they, they can't, uh, you know, match our track record. So what do they do? They got to start a rumor like this guy's turning loose captive deer. One guy who is a consultant in Michigan, this might take longer than two minutes, by the way. <laughs> One guy who's a consultant in Michigan quoted this to someone who told me directly. They heard it right from this other consultant. And uh, the cult consultant says, well, he doesn't even have captive deer anymore. And this guy comes up with some crazy idea. Yeah, but he's got this buddy in Wisconsin that brings up a truckload of captive deer to turn loose every year. The guy's a wannabe. He's a wannabe and he's never going to be, so he's got to try to bring me down. Total garbage. Okay. I'd like to comment on this. <laughs> you, will, you will have a remark after your question. Okay. You will both get one minute of remarks. That's fine. So, Tony, you have been bombarded with accusations. The bucks you claim are being shot in Michigan really be, are being shot somewhere else and not on the property you show to boot camp attendees. Do you really shoot these bucks on the properties you claim to shoot them on? Always, right like I say. And I will agree with Don. And, guys, we are di a little different. We hunt differently. But I'm going to tell you something. I know deer, and if a man's a not violator, it takes me two minutes to weed him out. Don's the real deal, and so am I. So I hate to disappoint anybody out there if you're looking for problems in that field. We are two of the real deals out here on killing big bucks. Now Don's hats off to him. Him and my legacies are already set. He is a master bow hunter killing 200 inch bucks, but I'm a guy that kills big, mature deer, too. They just don't score as good as his because of where I'm at. But a seven-and-a-half-year-old buck, whether he's 160 or 200, is a true trophy buck. And if we're men of our environment, and we're both great at the land that we grew up in. 
And uh, hats off to Don and me. I done stuff on that little 52 acres in Michigan that when people come, their head spins. And you know what? Sometimes you have to go against the green, and that's how I've always been. I know he wants me to be like a Biden, but I'm a Trump all the way. <laughs> <laughs> do, you, do you want to add a comment, Don? No, on, I, it's on just, this topic. As far as false accusations, yeah. As far as the false accusations, as far as trespassing, turning does loose, you know, basically people are saying you're doing it sneakily or behind the scenes. Well, haters are going to hate. You know, if they can't match your success, they're going to try to drag you down to where they are. And when you've been doing this as long as Tony and I have, you can spot the real deal and you can spot the wannabes. And it's the wannabes that are starting these rumors about people like Tony and I, and we're not the only ones, you know, that you could be successful at anything in life. And if you take your success to a certain level, the higher the level of success you achieve, the more people are gonna try to drag you down. And that's exactly what the two of us have had to experience. Okay, Tony. There are so many different types of broadheads available. Some have fixed blades and some have mechanical blades that open on impact. What type of broadhead do you feel is the best and most ethical way to harvest a deer? Do we have emergency people around in case Don <laughs> has a heart attack? I'm a mechanical man. They work great, they shoot like a dart, but I will defend something I do different than anybody I've ever met, unless they come to my boot camp. Guys, I use mechanical broadheads. Uh, I like a two blade, they shoot like a dart, and I get perfect pass-throughs, and my deer usually go less than 30 yards. But I'm gonna tell you something I do that I don't know anybody else that does. Once I get my stand, I'm this different, I, anyone that comes to my boot camp knows that I take and remake all the deer trails into my kill zone. And guys, most people, if there's a tree out there that's, say, 24 an inch in diameter, the deer runs on this side, I literally make the deer go on the other side with brush and whatever I need, and I take him on the other side so I can draw. When he goes up behind that, his eyes are blind, I draw, and when he comes out, I always make sure my deer are broadside for perfect pass-through. As long as you got a pass-through, I don't care what broadhead you use, it's gonna do the job. Where the problem comes is when you're taking a hard angle shot and a bad shot is a bad shot no matter what broadhead you use. So guys, I smoke them with my mechanical broadheads. Don, I hope I get a chance on this one. <laughs> Explain why an expandable broadhead with an extremely wide cutting diameter versus a smaller fixed broadhead blade with a much smaller cut is not more ethical and more effective at harvesting these whitetails you spend so much time pursuing. Because I would rather have a one inch hole all the way through a deer than a three inch hole in that far. Mechanicals are a chance you do not need to take. You don't need to take because it's not a matter of if they're gonna fail, it's a matter of when are they gonna fail. I have shot two deer. Where's my second one? This deer right here, Mel. You, a lot of you seen the video of Mel. Where'd I hit that deer? I hit that deer right in the shoulder blade. I had this much arrow sticking out. If I would have been using a mechanical, that deer would have been running around wounded for who knows how long. I would not have killed him. He went 50 yards as it is. I, and I can think of a second big mature buck that I shot where I hit him right smack in the shoulder blade. It sounded like somebody took a baseball bat and broke it in two. And you know what? That deer went about 70 yards. As much as we want to hit a deer perfect, it's not going to be perfect. And a lot of people don't have the discipline to wait on a perfect shot. You know, God has made us stewards for a period of time over different things that he's put in our care, whether it be a piece of land or whatever. And, you know, I lose a lot of respect for people if they don't treat animals humanely. I'm talking your pets, I'm talking livestock, 
And there is absolutely nothing wrong with us as hunters harvesting, killing deer. But when we do, we should do it as quickly and as humanely as possible. And a mechanical broadhead is a chance you don't need to take. And I hope, I don't know, I can't see how many people are out here. There's a bunch. I hope any of you that are using mechanicals, I hope you remember this night because I'm telling you, the day's gonna come when you're gonna use, lose a deer because of your choice of broadhead, and I want you to remember Don on this stage tonight because it very well might be the biggest buck of your life. So, have you ever had a mechanical fail? I, I've never used a mechanical, and, and people say, well, if you've never used a mechanical, you can't blast them. Well, you know what? I've never shot a deer with a field point either, but if you hit them right with a field point, you're gonna kill them. It's a chance I'm never taking. <laughs> Do you have a comment, Tony, on, on this? Mine must just be dying of shock because they only go 30 yards. That's all I know. And the blood trail's about this wide. <laughs> hey, if I you guess we're right. going to agree to disagree, but you know what? That's why we're up here. We both believe. But I'm going to just tell you this. Most guys don't take the time to tune their broadheads the right way, and they only shoot with practice points, and now their broadhead is not hitting their target. I honestly believe more deer are wounded with regular broadheads because they didn't take the proper training to make them fly straight. Mechanical broadheads should be melted down and made into boat anchors and outlawed. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We're moving into land management. The next segment will be the land management segment. We have 10 questions. And again, you get the same two minutes, which on your earlier questions, you weren't using quite your two minutes, just so you guys are aware. Yep. The last couple you did use, Don had went over once. So you will again have two minutes, and you will again get your extra minute for, um, allow for remarks. So the first one is a dual question, Don being first. Recently, an idea is really being promoted in the land management community. The idea is that if you improve your habitat, and especially if you have too much summer food, your property can become a doe factory. At that point, the does will kick off all the bigger bucks. Both of you seem to be managing for more deer by creating ideal habitat and all the food the deer herd could ever want. Is this not creating a disaster for your clients? And do you believe this should be a concern for land managers wanting to attract deer to their property? Well, it's not a concern for anybody that hires me because we're going to make a big buck factory instead of a doe factory. Um, I, I don't believe the, the, the doe factory theory. Um, I've never seen it. Um, never seen anything even closely resemble it. As a land manager, I, I want to be providing food to my deer herd 365 days a year. I, I don't ever want them to have to leave my farm to find food. Now, they're going to leave from time to time, but I don't want them to have to leave to find food. Um, I, I don't even know how to respond to the whole dough factory thing because it makes absolutely no sense to me, really. Um, you want to do everything you can to provide everything a deer needs at 365 days a year, be it bedding cover, food, whatever. And uh, the idea that you, you don't provide food in the summer, I just don't get it. Tony? Well, this again, we're going to disagree a little bit here. Now, I agree that you need to put food out all year long. It's crazy not to take care of them all the time. But I'm going to say right now, most people I deal with don't have the acreage. And so the larger the acreage you have, the more you can hold bucks in one area and does have their fawning in the other. But the truth of the matter is does get the best habitat. They're the next generation. A buck ain't going to fight her for food, water, and cover. She's the next generation. So guys, what I do on the little properties, the does are going to kick the bucks off anyhow. That's why you see most bachelor groups in a park effect woods in the summertime in open areas because the does don't want their fawns there because the coyotes will kill them. So I literally create nursery areas with high switchgrass, small areas with food, water, and cover. One of my favorite tactics is to put it within 100 yards of a road. Why? Coyotes don't get, they get nervous by roads. So I make all these little spots and break them up so does each can have their fawns in there. And midsummer, 
They no longer care about the bucks. The bucks now have been all summer long on a bachelor group on a lesser property. When their velvet comes off, they move back to the best habitat. That's my property. And now I own them for hunting season. So there is a difference in my opinion. And I've been designing them for over 30 years. My property becomes a nursery every spring. I might add that uh, my experience is based on the type of terrain I, I live in. I live in a heavily agricultural area. And no matter what I do on my farm, Tony's absolutely right. The, the Mother Nature's way of, of uh, ensuring survival of the species is when the does get ready to fawn, they get the best habitat to raise those fawns. And where I'm at, every year, no matter what I did on my farm, the bucks are not going to be there in the summer. They're going to go out and spend their summer in bachelor groups out in these large agricultural areas. So some of the difference here is probably a difference in the, the terrain around our properties. I'm, I think Tony probably lives in an area with a whole lot more woods and cover where I'm in those open ag areas, and the deer just uh, utilize the cover differently. Okay, <clears throat> we're moving to, to the next question. This is a dual question. Tony will be going first. If you had the opportunity to precisely choose the buck to doe ratio on your home farm, what would that ratio be? Well, I'm a strong believer that you don't want a one to one ratio or a two to one. Totally against what's been carved in stone to everybody. It's as simple as this, guys. The average buck is going to breed at least six does. You have a one-to-one -one ratio. When he's done breeding that doe, he don't care if he travels five miles to find the other five. He spends two days with each doe. So if he's breeding five other doe on somebody else's property, you lost 10 days of rut activity on your farm. You will never see him again with the compounds, the guns that are made now. People are great hunters. So the biggest trick is, is to make sure that buck stays on your property as much as possible. Nothing is 100%, but you need to do all you can. So I do keep more does on my property, and when the rut's on and stuff, I hold a lot of deer, and that's why also all these bucks want to scrape on my property, because there's a lot of girls to communicate with. You mentioned six. Is, is six that number? or I like, I like it to be in that four to five. I try to keep it as close, but you, it's hard because each doe group, you're trying to make sure deer are scattered off. The other thing you don't ever want to do is put your deer in one sanctuary. One big sanctuary is in your enemy. You want multiple so you can have multiple deer spread out and does. Tony owns 52 acres, 23 wooded on a very busy intersection in Michigan, which is a state not necessarily known for producing giant bucks like Illinois. Yet Tony has created an absolute whitetail paradise that amazes hunters from across the United States when they attend his boot camp. He has three good-sized walls of his house dedicated to displaying his many successful harvests with the vast majority of these coming off of his 52-acre property. He has seen as many as 22 bucks in one day out of one tree stand, and in a two-year span has collected 90 sheds on 52 acres. Don, do you believe your property is capable of holding this amount of bucks and produce this many sheds in two years? I believe it's, it's capable of that, but the problem is the state's deer management program is not allowing it to, just to be totally honest. So you, you would say that your property could, but due to restrictions on... We, we just don't have the deer population in my area. There, there's not... Uh, what, what was this, the uh, figures you quoted? The, 52 they, bucks? Yeah, he had seen... 22 bucks and found 90 sheds in two years. Well, there, there's probably not 90 sheds in my whole township in two years, to be honest. Um, and you can, there, there's guys here that have been to my farm uh, through the class or whatever and have seen how wide open the terrain is where I'm at. Um, I, my property absolutely could if, those, if that number of deer was living in our area, but we just don't have that number of deer. And the other thing I'll throw out is that uh, the reason Tony's able to accomplish that is he's got a degree of um, 
He's got a work ethic and he's got a degree of passion that most deer managers are never going to have. And I think I can match him. He probably disagrees with me. But if, you know, if, if my area had that many deer, I think I could hold them for sure. Tony, Don owns a 120-acre property that he does his land management work on. Many people have critiqued him saying, oh, he's in Illinois. That's where everyone would like to hunt. And that he hunts a big property, has the best possible genetics. Yet in reality, Don started with a mostly square block of timber spanning a mere 40 acres in size. Later, he acquired 80 acres of bear land that adjoins his 40-acre parcel of timber. Don himself has said that when he first started managing, the average size of a mature buck was only 150 inches, and occasionally one would reach 170 inches. Tonight, he has two bucks on this stage that exceed 200 inches, and both were harvested with a compound bow on his 120-acre property. Do you believe you are capable of ever harvesting a 200-inch buck on your 52-acre property? I truly doubt it. I'm hopeful, but I doubt it ever. Guys, I don't know if I'll ever get a booner, to be honest with you. And here's why. Guys, we can't use minerals. We can't feed. We have so many things working against us. We have the longest firearm season, uh, muzzleloader, doe hunting with guns. Our season is crazy. We're allowed two bucks. Everything that's wrong is in Michigan. I hate everything about our DNR. They, they do not care about quality. Okay? So... All I can do is do the best I can, but guys, I can't literally put a mineral out. Yet, at the same token, everybody still sells it. Guess what? I call and say my neighbor's using mineral, no big deal. Let Tony LaPratt, they say he's got minerals, and I'll, have, I'll be on the 6 o'clock news. So guys, I play every rule to the T, because why? I already know that everybody's gunning for me, and I ain't giving them the satisfaction. So guys, it does tie my hands, but I'm telling you this, antler size does not make the bucks intelligent. And I know Don's killed 200 inch, but he knows this too. It's the age of the buck that is the true trophy. Now that don't mean I don't want 200 inch bucks. Don't get me wrong, and Don, and he's seeking them out, that is power to him. But I'm a guy that's just going to stay at my little home and make it the best it can. And me, it's going to be around a 160, seven and a half, five and a half year old buck right there. He's going to be in that 160. And maybe someday I may get better genetics in our area, but it's tough. So we are men of our environment again. But hats off to him to get his bucks up to 200 inch from 160. Guys, we both are doing amazing things to our property. The only difference I see between me and Don, he does it in a, a better area where there's older bucks and, and better genetics, and I do it in a tough area with a lot of hunters, and properties are smaller. Acreage buys you mistakes, not that Don makes them, but this is simple as how I look at life. The more acreage you have, the more mistakes you can make. A little property, you're not allowed mistakes. So guys, you need to make sure every ounce. Now guys don't have to go in and make their woods be everything. I zone it. Every inch of my property has to be special. I don't have the luxury, 23 acres. And we will answer this question later. I could talk a long time right now. So, so, so Don alluded that he doesn't have basically the deer numbers. Is basically what he alluded to. Do you believe that your strategy, that you could take Don's property in his location and improve it to 22 bucks seen in one day and 90 sheds in two years? Don, I'm pretty busy, but I'll try to fit you in. <laughs> <laughs> that was too easy. Guys, the what's different, <clears throat> and if I had bigger acreage, would I take and split all my fields up and work all that hard in every woods to zone it? No, I would not. But I need to, to accomplish what I'm trying to do. So guys, 
If I was lucky enough to have 300 acres, I ain't saying Don has that, but if I own 300 acres, I would not do half of what I do and still would be successful. I'm a man that goes, listen, every inch of my property needs to be worked. It's not for everybody. When people come, they're like, whoa, you do a lot of stuff. And I said, guys, I'm constantly working on my property. So, so Tony said that he may never shoot a booner. We all know what a booner is, a boon and crockett buck. Do you think that if you would hunt using your practices that you use, that you could kill a booner on Tony's property? I, I don't know because I've never been to Tony's property. But I do believe if I was 20 years younger, I'd be a, buying a farm in southern Michigan to prove a few things. Um, <laughs> I, I trust that he is doing, he is maximizing the potential of his property. For me, who has never been there, to criticize what he's doing on that 53 acres, I think is a little bit unfair. Mm-hmm. Okay. I wouldn't mind commenting just go, one second. Go for it. This is my honest opinion from my heart. There ain't a buck that I've ever killed that Don couldn't kill, and there ain't a buck Don ever killed that I couldn't kill. We are two master deer hunters. There's no doubt about it. And now it's just technique that works best for you guys. That's all it is. Each one of you have a different scenario. But I, I can't shoot something that don't go there, and he can't shoot it neither if it don't exist. Okay, we'll move on to the next question. Every hunter in this building would love, and Tony, you're going first, would love for every mature buck in his hunting area to stay on his grounds every minute of daylight during the entire hunting season. Tony has a system that he calls time management for big bucks. Explain why your strategy keeps bucks on your property. Well, it don't keep them on all the time, but it's the best system that I have ever found, and it's the best out there for what I'm trying to accomplish. But guys, I just use a simple thing. Three and a half acre field. When it was one smooth food plot, you could see flat as a pancake, Every year, a doe would have her two fawns up by the road. The bucks would come to the far corner, see every inch in it, put a couple of rubs and scrapes, average about five minutes, and gone. I broke it into 13 chunks with seven-foot grass. Now I have several does having fawns in there because they only fight if they see somebody. If you make and break it up, you get more fawns. I'm trying to hurry here. But now when the buck comes, he only sees a little corner, and there's 13 chunks in there. He now goes to each one and puts rubs and scrapes. He's marking each area as an individual field. Guess what? In five years, I averaged 75 rubs and scrapes on that field. And the biggest thing is the average buck that walked in there was around 45 minutes versus five. Time management. Guys, it took me two seconds to look in this crowd when I come around that curtain to see who was here. Why? Everybody's right here. But if there was a curtain 20 feet out in front of me, I wouldn't know how many people were behind it. That's as simple as it is. People want to make it hard? I agree with Don. We don't need to make it hard, but it's simple things that make sense. The more you screen, the more deer you will hold on your property and the more they will mark. Okay, Don, and you will get a remark after this, Tony, if you wish. Don, every hunter in this building, again, would love to have their bucks busy, without using a time management for big bucks, how can you hold your bucks on your property the entire day with nothing in place to occupy them? Because my property has the least intrusion of any property in my entire township. Uh, A big buck's number one desire is freedom of human intrusion. I totally stay out of my property from the time, I would go in in the spring one time and look for shed antlers after that shed antler hunt, I'm, I'm gone. And I don't come back till the fall when I'm hunting on the edges, my scent blowing out. Those bucks know that they're never gonna encounter a human on my property. And that's why they learn that when they're yearlings and that's why they keep coming back and that's why we put age on them. Uh, they just learn that it's the safest place in the whole neighborhood and that's what it takes. So do you think you're losing bucks since you don't have the screenings that Tony has and, and stuff to, for them to check out? I don't think I'm, I, I'm losing bucks. Everybody loses bucks. Um, but I, I maintain a lot of bucks too, or, or you know, carry them from one age class to the next. Um, 
you know, why, I, I mean, I don't know that if I would screen it, I would hold any more. Um, I think I'm holding, you know, about what I can. I'll have, you know, anywhere from four to six bucks on my place every fall and one day that are four years old and older. Um, some of the guys that have hunted here on, on my place, if you, actually, if you watch the Mel video, that morning I filmed six different bucks. He was buck number seven on, on that farm that morning, and there wasn't a dink in the bunch. It's the freedom of human intrusion that keeps them there. Do you have a comment? Yes, I would like to comment. Here's where me and Don are really different. Guys, I don't got to tell you, I've done a ton of properties in this area for Amish, Mennonite, and other people that are here. What are you people? And I never talk politically correct, but you're family people. One of the biggest problems when I go to someone's property, there's a ton of hunters because there's a ton of kids. So what do I have to do? I have to make as many bucks on your property as possible. I have to make sure there's a lot of stands, and I have to realize that you guys use your land for everything. My wife, every day at 5 o'clock, goes and feeds the catfish in the summertime with two Rottweilers. Now, I can't look at my wife, no more than most of you in here, and say, well, we can't go back there because we might spook a buck. I have to adapt. And I take everybody at my boot camps when we're walking, I go any place you want to go is not off limits. If I walk into a bedding area, the two big bucks I killed this year, people went into, that, into them bedding areas. So all I'm here to tell you is I have to make the areas thick. I have a total different setup for that. And, that, and I'm going to tell you now, I wouldn't take people in there in the middle of the summer. They'd destroy my property. But I can go in there in the spring when they shed their racks, and I have many weeks that I can go in there and show all my tricks of the trade and still only hunt a few days that fall and kill my buck. Everything has a time and a place, and there's a time you just stay out. Do you have a comment, Don? Or? I just The only comment I would have is that I wonder if Tony took his approach and applied my freedom of human intrusion to that approach how much better it might possibly be. Okay, we're moving on to the next question. We'll get to some of those questions later on. Tony's strategy of creating a deer haven is not having a large set-aside sanctuary, but instead creating beds throughout his cover with certain beds for the does and certain beds for the bucks to hold more deer on his property. Why have you not adapted this method to better accommodate for more deer in your sanctuary. And if you did, alluding to your earlier statement, you don't have the deer numbers, would this improve it? Would it improve the deer numbers? I, I, I don't think it would at all. I, I'm, I'm confident it would not. It, it's the state's management practices that keep our deer numbers low. Um, as far as you know, creating specific beds, I, it just, it, it's a whole lot of work that I don't have time for, to be bu uh, brutally honest. Um, Tony likes to create buck beds, doe beds. I like to create deer motels and let them pick their own beds. So, and that, that's my approach really. I mean, is, is a large, thick sanctuary, totally free of human intrusion. Those deer are gonna find a place in there to bed. And, and it doesn't really matter to me that he's bedded in this specific location or this specific location. If I get him bedded on that property, I'm gonna get a chance to kill him. Okay, Tony, Don describes a sanctuary as doing a timber harvest if necessary, and then cut every low value tree and making a mess without crossing the lines of the deer not being able to get through. Per his description, making motels instead of beds. He then will stay out completely with the exception of shed hunting one day out of the year and retrieving deer. With getting the work done and staying out and letting the deer have this large, safe sanctuary, why is this not the best method of creating a deer haven on your property? Do you want to take your deer hunting success to the next level? Do you want to take your hunting property to the ultimate level? Don Higgins Whitetail Master Academy is a one-of-a-kind source of cutting-edge information to help whitetail hunters and land managers become more successful. 
By joining Don Higgins Whitetail Master Academy, you'll see firsthand video presentations on designing real hunting properties. You'll see Don's actual tree stand locations where he has harvested giant bucks and hear him dissect these stand sites. Today we're gonna to feature one of my favorite tree stands. So let me set the stage for you here. This stand is located along the west side. You'll also learn hunting tactics specifically targeting mature bucks. This is the most in-depth resource online for hunting mature whitetail deer. Sign up today to unlock Don's secrets to success in the whitetail woods. Because the average person can't afford that large property. Life has changed, guys. I don't got to tell anybody in here how much land goes for. Guys, you know how many 20-acre properties and 30 acres I do? We can't make it perfect, but we got to make it the best it can. With luxury, again, is the more acreage you have, the more you don't have to fine tune it. The smaller the acreage, the more intense the land management. Guys, 23 acres is about the size of this building. Okay? I have to make every inch count. Is it work? Yes, it is. But if that's what the hand you're dealt, we have to make it the best we can. And that's what I do. To me, that's a luxury if you have larger properties. Five acre switchgrass field. Guys, I plant switchgrass fields that ain't half the quarter size of this room. Now, I know most people would say that's worthless, but you wanna know what? Every spring I can get a fawn in there. And guess what, when the rut's on, because it ain't a very bedding area, the buck will stick that hot dough in there because he's got a little place to hide her, and that's what I'm after. So again, I'm micromanaging everything. The smaller the property, the more important freedom of human intrusion. And I would agree to that once it gets to a certain time. So midsummer, guys, all my boot camps are done in May. After that, my property is free of intrusion except for the pond areas. And I tell my wife to make noise every time she goes to them because the animals get used to her always going and the dogs and them never vary from their path. And she does that every day. They sit right in the woods and listen to her. So I agree that we cannot bump them, but there is a time you can. Okay, we're moving on to the next segment, or the next question. Tony, uh, Don does not promote artificial water sources and has called them kiddie pools. Questioning whether the people using this strategy have ever killed a mature buck over them. Have you ever killed a mature buck over an artificial water source? And explain why people such as Don are missing the point by not utilizing this method. Well, I'll be honest, I never shot one out of a tank. But I build little water holes that ain't even from me to you in the ground. And make it like a glorified mud puddle a couple feet deep. Now them, I have my bucks hit hard. So guys, I make in my, anybody that's been on my property know I have these all over my property and the deer love them. They love this warm, shallow water. The turkeys, squirrels, everything. Now, I have had a buddy kill a monster buck out of a tank, but most of the time, all mine are trying to be natural, but if a guy doesn't have anything, a tank's better than nothing. Some guys can't have a pond because the water drains too much. And they try the liners and the deer poke holes. So again, we adapt to the best system that we can. Okay, Don, Tony has many artificial water sources on his property, even though he has a river flowing through his property. Now it is a well-known fact that a deer will drink out of a mud hole with warmer water next to a stream He'll, he'll drink warm water versus going and drinking cold water. Why do you not utilize these so-called kiddie pools, and what keeps your deer from leaving your property for a preferred water source? Well, first of all, I think the term kiddie pool was taken a little bit out of context. There's actually people on the Internet that promote taking these little kids' swimming pools and burying them in the ground. That's where the term kiddie pool comes in, these, these uh, buried little kids swimming pools. Um, the reason that I, I don't get hung up on water sources is, is there is a place not far from my house where every summer 
there is a bachelor group on this section of ground. Um, and, and I'm talking section road to road, road to road. There is absolutely no water source on that section anywhere. It's almost 100% agriculture with a, the exception of a few tree lines, hedgerows, if you will. I, I have been all over that section. I cannot figure out for the life of me why these bucks are out there every summer, day after day, put my trail cameras on the same trees every year. I, I don't know where these deer are getting water. I, I'm sure they're getting the, the majority of the moisture they need out of the plants they're consuming. Those, they're out there feeding on soybeans every summer. I, I, that has, has been a real eye-opener for me, that, that one experience. My, my real issue with water sources, the one like Tony described is, is fantastic. There's nothing wrong with that. But these guys, they want to bury these kiddie pools in, and, and then that requires them to go onto the property with these water tanks to continually fill that, that kiddie pool you know, every week or two throughout the summer. And, and that is human intrusion. It's not that I object to, to having water sources on a property. I do object to having water sources that need to continually be artificially filled. And I agree with that part there. I'm always telling people, every time you go back after a certain time of the summer, you now can do more harm. That's why, I, you know, the new cameras are great. But I'm a guy that don't like cameras. Because why? Everybody wants to get the chips out. So we'll another intrusion, but we got that coming up, it looks mm -hmm. like. Okay, Don, you have clearly stated you prefer the largest field of switchgrass possible versus a more and smaller fields. You also do not mow any trails through any of your switchgrass. Why don't you mow trails so you can control how, these, how they use your switchgrass fields and be able to hold more bucks by splitting them up? Explain why you feel your way is more effective. The reason that I no longer, because I did at one point mow trails through switchgrass, the reason I no longer do is this buck right here. That buck lived on my farm. He preferred to bed in switchgrass. What I've noticed on my farm is that some individual bucks prefer to bed in the grass fields. Other individual bucks prefer to bed in the wooded cover. This one preferred to bed in the grass. And I, when he was three and four years old, I was mowing paths through those grasses and I got video footage of this buck walking through those fields and he would cross those mowed paths, but never, ever did I see this buck follow a mowed path. A mature buck, a lot of them, they're all individual, they're all different. And I wanna set myself and my hunting strategies are geared towards killing the toughest one. If I can kill the toughest one, I can kill the easy ones. A lot of mature bucks, want to feel that brush or grass or something right up against their side. They don't want to be just, just walking along and uh, in a mowed path. They feel exposed. When they can feel that grass up against their side, they, they feel way more comfortable and they will do that in daylight. Now sure, there's going to be exceptions. Some bucks are going to walk right down the middle of a mowed path. Those bucks, I'll kill. But I also want to kill the ones that won't. And a, a much better um, strategy that I've found instead of these mowed paths is go out into that switchgrass field and plant a row of miscanthus. And instead of a mowed path, you can take a strip of miscanthus from the edge of your field where your tree stand's located and you can run it right out into the heart of that, that switchgrass field. And those deer will not only bed against that miscanthus, it's like structure, it's fish, it's like a Christmas tree in a pond um, for fish structure. Those deer, when they get up, they will, they will walk along the edge of that taller miscanthus right out to, to where your stand is at. And I've found that to be much more effective on mature bucks. Uh, again, a mode path works great for, for some bucks, does, younger bucks, but you're going to get some tough mature bucks that are not going to follow that mode path. Okay, and you can, you can add a remark later. Tony, you like more and smaller patches of switchgrass. You indicated the size of this room. Um, versus the larger fields. If deer like security, why do you take cover away from them by mowing trails and splitting them up in smaller sections and explain why this is... Well, defective. first of all, I don't mow what you're thinking of a bush hog. I make a 16-inch path that I spray and I make a deer run through that woods, okay? There's no mowed paths through my grasses. I, use, I make trails. 
And it's deadly because if we take a stand in the back and we have a stand here and this is switchgrass, I go over here 20 yards as soon as I plant that grass and I start a deer run and I spray it and I curve it and make it go on the opposite tree 20 yards this way, the deer will use that run. As the grass grows up, they're going to start following it. Guess what I just did? Two different wind directions. Then in the middle... I take and hook off of there and make individual beds. But you really want to make a switchgrass special? Go make an island in it. Now, guys, you take a big 20-acre field of switchgrass, you can't predict where that buck's going to bed. He may bed in there, but you're going to have to go find his bed. But if I go out there and any little knoll before I start planting that grass, I go out there and make sure that I plant a circle of shrubs Macanthus grass, pompous grass, plant a pine tree, autumn olive. When that grass grows up, bucks are habit of two edges meeting. When you walk out there, if there's a bush out there, the bed will be beside the bush and the grass. So now I can literally even get the deer to bed in the field where I want them so my scent does not blow on them. And by pre-making the run, I determine what side the tree they're going to come on and what wind direction to hunt them. Do you have a remark, Don? Yeah, I, I've. Uh, I, you can dictate where a buck beds in a field of switchgrass with miscanthus. I, I've started planting uh, uh, miscanthus in the switchgrass in the shape of a giant X, and those deer like to bed in the corners, those pockets of that X. There's four four different pockets, and, and I actually stumbled on that by accident. I had a a, a miscanthus planting around the edge of a switchgrass field. Uh, on my farm, that, that field came to a corner, so there was an L-shaped um, planting of miscanthus, and in that corner, every year, there would be a buck bedded. So I, I just, you know, naturally, I started creating corners with miscanthus in my switchgrass fields, but to be honest, I, I don't care where the buck beds in that switchgrass field. What I care about is where he's entering and exiting, and I can use miscanthus um, to dictate that. And that's the difference of one hunter versus somebody that's trying to have five hunters. The more people you have, everything matters. Now, if I'm, I'm a hunting my property, I'm here to teach people how to set a property up. Guys, I wouldn't have to do half the work to kill my big bucks. What my work is there to show people at a boot camp is to show them how to fix that property so they can put four or five hunters, and everything matters the more hunters. Me and Don... We can almost go any place and kill a big buck. We got the skill and the knowledge. What I'm there to do is show people that don't have that ability and now make their property be something special so their boys can hunt. And I'll even tell them, guys, you don't want to put them here until they're ready. But that's what we're trying to do is make it more friendly to a larger, larger hunters. We have a lot of young hunters coming up the pike. And guys, it was a different world when me and... Don grew up than it is today. You let a kid not see nothing for two days, he's given up on deer hunting for the rest of his life. Okay, we're moving on to the next question in land management. Tony, your method of hinge cutting seems very labor intensive and very hard to maintain with all the follow-up care, annual maintenance. Is there a better way or is it well worth the time and sweat equity to this method? It's the only reason I'm on this stage. I zoned my woods and hold more bucks than anyone else has ever put on a piece of property. And if we took my hinge cutting away, I wouldn't be here talking. Guys, that's how I separate my bucks, my does. It's how I put more deer per acre. If I just had a woods that was thick and I wasn't making individual beds, I could not hold the deer numbers I hold. Again, it is work and I tell everybody, it's work. But if you only own 10 acres of woods, we need to make it the best it can be. If you got 500 acres, we won't do nothing. I'll just come and hunt with you and we'll kill some big boys. Don, you have strongly shared your opinion of hinge cutting. You believe there is a much better way and that we should be better stewards of our, so to speak, timber. Can you explain this opinion? Yeah, I'd be glad to. If, um, if a tree is so invaluable to you that you're going to hinge cut it, why not just cut it down and let something of value grow in its place? Um, 
my, my biggest objection to hinge cutting is there's too many guys out there doing it that don't know an oak from a maple, let alone a red oak from a white oak or a shingle oak or a pin oak. And, and I've been on many properties where a, some maniac with a chainsaw has went through and just hinge cut like a madman and destroyed a lot of good oak trees that, are, that could have been t good timber one day. Now, if you're selective about how you're doing it, if you've already, you know, you're leaving some, some nice oaks among your hinge cutting, yeah, I, I guess you could, you could do that. And, and I don't want to say I'm totally against hinge cutting. When I go onto my property to thicken it up, if you will, um, a bet for bedding cover, I, I will do some hinge cutting. But a lot of it depends on what's laying around. I, I would guess that probably 95% of the trees I cut are going to be cut off at the ground. And sometimes I will hinge cut them for a period of two or three years and then come back and, and cut them off. I, I want to create, I want to keep ground cover there, but I also want to get sunlight in. When you hinge cut a tree, that top is still alive. That top is still shading the ground. Um, the tree's root system is still alive. It's still competing with the trees around it. If, if a tree has so little value that I'm going to hinge cut it, I'd just as soon get rid of it and, and allow something better to grow in its place. I'd like to follow up. So here's how it is. 30% of most all the trees in the woods will never make a log, okay? Because the quality of the tree, crookness, disease, etc. You take that 30% and hinge cut it. And I will agree with one thing. If there's the biggest mistake made is everybody just hears the word hinge cut and they make the tornado look. You come to my boot camp, every cut has a special height diameter, everything matters, and I got trees that are 30 years old that have been hinge cut, and there are three hinge cuts on that same tree. I hinge cut the hinge cut. And then people go in my deer cave, I call it, and there's everybody in here, there's a bunch of them. It's amazing. Guys, there's a right way to do it. The problem with the word hinge cut is every farm boy heard that word and said, oh, we cut three quarters way through the tree and make it hit the ground. And guess what? They're doing it all wrong. Even they do it in the dead of winter and all these people tell you to do it. When it's below freezing, the tree is frozen. It is not going to live. Guys, it has to be sap flowing for it to stay alive. You can't bend an icicle. So again, people take what I show and changed it. It ain't the same thing as my property. Okay. Don, on October 30th, 2020, you harvested an absolute giant that you named Mel. After you shot, you waited hours for your grandsons to show up and share this special moment with you. If these two grandsons had no desire in deer hunting, they had zero desire in deer hunting, yet they would love to rabbit hunt and they ask you to take them rabbit hunting on this property, would you allow or deny? Absolutely. You would allow or deny? I, I would allow them to, to deer hunt or to rabbit hunt. Yeah. Those, those grandsons mean more to me than any deer. Okay. So, so you're saying you value human intrusion, but you would make the exception if you had a grandson that had zero desire, might never lift a gun to shoot a deer, Mm -hmm. If he wanted to come hunt with Grandpa, you would take him rabbit hunting. Absolutely. That day's coming. I know it's coming. Those two grandsons are in this front row right here. And, uh, I mean, that's one of the biggest reasons that I'm looking to buy another property right now so that uh, those boys can do what they want. I'm hoping Don will adopt me as a boy and I'll <laughs> deer hunt with him. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Tony. Seven years ago, you posted a video on YouTube about the post rut. In this video, you are explaining that in the post rut, which you say in your home state of Michigan is practically the second day of gun season, a buck will be in his hardcore bedding area. And quote, back here in the swamp, he's on some little island or some thicket or where a bunch of storms went through and blew a bunch of trees down, he's inside of there. If this is what old mature bucks prefer to bed in, why do you spend the time hinge cutting a property? Because what I'm trying to do is create a dry land swamp. 
If you look at a swamp in Michigan, there's 750,000 gun hunters. We're the third largest army on November 15th. <laughs> Think about it. Whole wars are fought with 300,000 people. All we need in Michigan are tags. <laughs> now, let's get back to the question. So the point is, they are, once the, the opening day of gun season, every buck, everybody knows they go to some place a hunter won't go. And they're finding the thickest cover they can find, and they're trying to huddle in a little area. I go in and hinge cut, and when you're in my hinge cuts, you can't see 20 yards in any direction. What did I just really create? The same look they get in a swamp, and they can't see anything, and they, anything that tries to come through, they're going to make so much noise, so they feel safe. That's what I do. So I create thick areas and make them dense so when the shooting goes, it's simple as this. There's three types of properties. The one the deer are running away from, the one they're heading to, and there's one other one that I talk about. A lot of guys will have a big swamp and it's packed full of deer and they're hunting around the outside edge, but no deer will come out during daylight hours. That is hunter related. They are not doing good scent control. They're making noise getting in and out. So I go, guys, the deer come on my property and all the neighbors and the deer come to my place to hide during gun season and yet they think it's safe and they move. Because why? Thick cover and everything's hidden and now they think they're safe. If I need to use late season, and I would like to correct one other thing, it ain't me not correct. Dons are all with bow and power to him. But I set out a long time ago to take care of people's property. Guys, I don't know why I was blessed to be what I am, but a long time ago I go, I want to make my living. And like Don even said, I'm the guy that started this and, and thing. My goal was not to, to basically defend anybody or, or make them feel uncomfortable. I have taken deer with my shotgun. I've killed a couple with muzzleloaders. I've shot up most of them with bows, but I've shot some with the crossbow. Why? If someone in here says, Tony, I hunt with a pistol, next year I'll shoot one with a pistol. I want when you call me, I can go, oh, yeah, I got a couple of those. Why? I want you to understand I'm not picky on what you use. As long as you're following the law and the regulations, I'm your buddy. Simple as that. Okay. Tony, you stated that you micromanage everything, basically splitting up food plots, cover, creating as many edges as possible. Finding 90 sheds in two years on 52 acres seems to be as close to stockpiling bucks as possible. Is this a result of your micromanaging? And please explain why other land managers are missing out on more bucks using their property and why this is so important in the land management strategy. Well, I think it's, it's a, I've been at this a long time, but yet it's still kind of new if you look in the, the new uh, style of management. But I zone my woods, just like I zone a field. I break it up. So now I want to zone it. Now a zone, I'd mislead you if I didn't tell you my river made, makes my property twice the size. Because as that river winds through my woods, I can get a doe group to bed on this side and a doe group on this side, and the river ain't 20 foot wide. But if that river wasn't there, the two doe groups would fight. Because there's a water, it's like a fence, and they look at each other, and you better stay over there, girl. And guess what? That makes me, that's how I got the idea. I noticed that the river, I can have bucks on either side. And then I thought, what happens if I start making hinge cuts and put a wall, make holes through there, but they can't see the next side? What does it do? It starts letting more deer utilize the woodlot. Now, guys, it ain't worth it if you got big acreage to do all this. But the smaller the woodlot, the smaller the property, the more aggressive we have to be. And that's why I said Don ain't wrong in what he does. And I ain't always right on what I do. But I'm showing little properties how do you split it up and make it the best it can be. I don't tell a guy that owns 500. Guys, I set up a 3,000 acre property. I set up a 6,000 acre. You think I had him hinge cut and plant and everything like I do? He wouldn't get done in 10 lifetimes. Okay, Don, in, 2000, in July 2017, you had an article in North American Whitetail stating, killing mature bucks doesn't require a property that's laid out with the complexity of a circuit board. You also deemed micromanaging unnecessary. 
assuming you are on a 53-acre property and not your own, how, explain why would you still instill this method? Because I've killed bucks on properties where absolutely nothing has been done. In fact, I, I mentioned earlier, my top six bucks came from five different properties. Two of those came on the property that I own, and it would be the two bucks here behind me. The rest of the other four of my top six bucks came from four different properties, three different counties. Not a single habitat improvement was done on any of those properties. There was not a food plot. There was no enhancement done to the bedding cover. Absolutely nothing. The only thing that those properties had was freedom of human intrusion. Most of that cover was very small. Uh, the Joey buck I shot in 2020 right after shooting Mel, there was probably three acres of cover on that entire farm, but it was three acres of cover that every other deer hunter in the area totally ignored. And, and once I f figured out that freedom of human intrusion is a, is a mature buck's number one desire, my hunting success skyrocketed. And not just on my property, I'm talking about any property. When I go looking for, for a property to get permission, I'm looking, on, I'm looking for things that other deer hunters are totally ignoring and, and not asking for permission on. Okay, we're going to go to the consulting segment. This is a dual question, Don going first. With tons of consultants to choose from today, it seems that some must be promoting things that in reality are hurting land managers. In your opinion, what is the number one myth being promoted in land management today? Oh, wow. I'm not sure what the number one myth is, but uh, I think that there's a lot of guys out there trying to be land managers who haven't learned how to be deer hunters yet. And if you look at their success, um, there's just nothing there. If, if you can't kill mature bucks, how are you going to teach someone else to do it? So, I, I mean, I don't know that there's one, you know, thing that's, that they're promoting that, that's the worst. I, I just think there's a lot of people that don't even know how to, to kill big deer that are trying to teach other people how to do it. So are you basically saying you should kill big deer before you can consult? I'm not necessarily big deer. It depends on what you're consulting for. I mean, you, you should at least be able to, and that's one reason before, you know, I take on a client, I've got a list of questions I ask them. I want to know what their goal is. Um, I, I want to know uh, what the hunting pressures are like around their property and a lot of other things. But, you know, would you go to, would you take your car to have the brakes worked on by someone who's never worked on car brakes before? Would you let someone operate on you if they've never done that type of surgery before? Why in the world would you hire someone who's never killed the, the class of animal that you're trying to kill if he's never done it? And I guess that would be my biggest pet peeve with the whole consulting industry, if you will. Okay, Tony. I agree with him 100% about there's people out there. They're not who they say they are. And a guy should be consistent. He should be consistent on mature bucks. And the other thing that I think is the biggest mistake out there, everybody is trying to do hinge cuts, but they don't understand the proper technique. So they are damaging serious quality trees and doing harm to their woods while they think they're making it better. And that's what's sad. Guys, for the price of what you make one mistake in the woods, a guy can come to a place like mine for $895 and spend two days and learn the proper technique. And yet guys will go out there and start cutting trees. I've been on properties, they hired me, and walnut trees were hinge cut. I'm not joking with you. Tons of them. I go, you worried about my fee? Guys, there's a right way to do everything. And what happens is there's enough information out there on the internet to make people dangerous. So just make sure when you're getting information, you got the right guy standing in front of you talking. One thing about me and Don, we both are successful at what we do. Okay, Tony will go first on this one. There are many, many options for someone looking to hire a consultant today. And each and every consultant seems to think that he is the best available. Is your strategy, basically the micromanaging and all that, a one-size-fits-all approach? 
and explain why I should hire you over every other option, including the gentleman beside you. I've never been second. Until today. Guys, we got, <laughs> we got two alpha males up here, and it's ridiculous to ask, guys. There's, I will say this. There is no one out in the land management business that has came up with more cutting-edge things than me. I mean, I can sit here and name things that never was invented until I came along. And guys, that's where I shine. On little properties and techniques when you need it, every little thing matters. Don? Why should they hire me? Why should they hire you over Tony? And why is your method of more vastness versus micromanaging? Proven success. There's not another consultant who has killed multiple 200-inch bucks and has, also has clients that have killed multiple 200-inch bucks. Just last season, in the month of October alone, just the month of October, I had three clients kill 200-inch bucks. Two more killed 190-inch bucks. Another one killed 180-inch bucks. West Delks is a prodigy of mine, if you will. Um, he is, I've known him for years. He follows my system to a T. He's only been consulting for two years. He already has a client in Michigan who's killed a 200-inch buck on their farm. That, that hunter is here tonight. Um, proven success. And I have a ton the same way, guys. I'm never going to probably shoot a 200-inch buck. But I have clients in southern Ohio. I got a doctor down there. He's got a wall full of big bucks. But you want to know what, guys? He also owns 1,200 acres, and he shoots them like they're nothing. The average guy cannot do that on a 50-acre farm. So the thing is, guys, I always make sure people understand you have limitations to your resources. And I will try to make the best of what your resources are. It's all we can do. Okay? Okay, Don goes first on this one. A good number of consultants available today offer complete property plans with the customer sending an aerial photo of his or her property, and the consultant designs the property and sends it back. These consultants are generally more affordable and seem way more convenient for everyone involved. Why should I spend more money and extra time to hire a consultant that will need to walk my property? Well, most consultants that are, are marking aerial photos are concerned about one thing, their pocketbook. They're not concerned about your success. Every time that I go to a property to consult, I see an aerial ahead of time. And every time I look at that aerial and I get a plan in my head, I think, okay, I already know what I'm going to do to this farm. And, and then I go and I visit that farm, and at least, at least 80% of the time, I change my mind after I put boots on the ground. There's just so many little subtle things that an area will never show. Um, if someone is, has a service where they're marking aerial photos, topographical maps, whatever, they're ripping you off, period. And I hope Tony is not one of those guys. <laughs> Them guys are scams. Guys, people come to my boot camp and we go out there in the woods and walk and they all go, Tony, Later, can you look at your maps? I said, yeah, but let me first show you stuff. So we go out and look at my property, and then later on I bring up this great big area photo of my property. And I go, guys, remember how we were going through all these tunnels and everything? Yeah. Look at this. These are 80-foot trees. These are about 8-foot tall. Tell me the difference in the two. You can't tell. Guys, People always said, Tony, when you come to your property, do you want me to mail you an aerial photo? And I said, have it available the day I'm there because the only thing that matters is what I see when I walk it. I do not look at aerial maps before I go because it's a waste of time. I wait until I'm there. I need the aerial map just to make the plan written on it. But you must walk the land to see what's there. Every tree, shrub, age structure, variety matters. So guys, don't waste your time. And today, and you're probably out here, I've had two guys today want me to look at their aerial maps and actually draw up a plan wanting to know what I do. I said, come to my boot camp. I don't do that. 
The only reason that I have a potential consulting clients in an aerial is I want to see how his property connects to the neighboring properties. I'm going to, I want to see where that hunting pressure might be right up against his property line. That's the main thing I'm looking for. It just comes natural that I get an idea in my head by looking at that aerial. But again, 80% of the time plus, it's just thrown out the window and we start over. That's why once I get there, I tell them I want to see it there. I look at it. I have a memory that's unbelievable. I look at something. It's in my head forever. I look at that map, and I start walking. Guys will be out there. We'll be walking, and the guy goes, and we stop, and I start marking. And the guy goes, um, and I go, we're right here. <laughs> Guys, I spent my life in the woods. I don't get turned around. I know where I'm standing at any one moment on a property. That's why an aerial is nice to have once you're there. But it does not make a decision until we walk. And I, I, I believe Don's the same way as what he's saying. Okay, Tony going first. What is the success rate of your clients? And also for every unsatisfied customer you have ever had, what is the number one thing hindering their success? Guys, I take great pride. There's so many guys in here that have had my services, and I'm respected, and it's almost overwhelming how much respect I'm shown. I'm an old farm boy. I was a D student in school, and the people come up, and they're always happy with me. Why? Now, they ain't that they don't need to talk to once in a while, and we got to make a little change here or there, but my people, that's how my business is built. Word of mouth is what I got, and there's so many clients out here and guys, they all come up and shake my hand and always come up and say, Tony, thank you. And I look at their pictures and I take great pride. And I'm sure Don has the same thing because we are at the top of our fields. What is the thing that hinders what my is, client's success? Yes. Without a doubt, they don't follow the plan. There's a, a, just a lot of people that don't have the passion for deer hunting that Tony and I share. Um, to them, it's a, it's a weekend thing. They think about it during the fall. We think about it 365 days a year. Without a doubt, when a client contacts me after a successful hunt, it's a client that has followed the plan almost to the letter. And there, there's people that, that also, the clients that try to make it way more complicated than it really is. They look at the plan, they think, well, it can't be that simple. Well, on some properties, it is pretty simple. Um, but I think it's the mindset of the client that they need to, if they're going to hire somebody, whether it be me, Tony, or whoever, they need to be committed to at least giving that, that plan a shot. And when I say a shot, they need to give it a minimum of three years. Five would be better. Let's see if this guy's plan, I mean, we just paid him thousands of dollars. Let's see if he knows what he's talking about. Let's just not scrap the thing or, or try to put our twist on it. And it's, it's clients not following the plan that, that hinders their own success. And all I will say is I have a service that I offer every client. If they're tearing up all your trees, I'll come in there and get him out of there for you at no charge. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We're going to move on to the next question. Don going first. Um, with all the emphasis and extreme measure consultants and land managers like yourself are putting into property management for whitetail white-tailed deer today, how can an individual like myself get permission to run my coon hounds on a property and also hunt small game? You are promoting how bad dogs are to deer while I walk right past with my light in their face and they never even bother. What exactly started the idea that coon hunting is not tolerated by deer? And are you saying the sport on running coon hounds cannot coexist with deer hunting? Not on my farm, it can't. There, there is nothing that worse on a deer property than dogs. Nothing. Not even human. I would rather see a line of humans walk up and drive my property than a bunch of dogs running through there. Uh, you know, a, when a human walks through, a buck has a, a, a choice to make. He can either flee or he can lay tight. Well, that dog's going to sniff that deer out. My experience with the captive deer for about 25 years, I noticed that nothing spooked those deer like a dog did. 
And they could tell the difference between a dog and a coyote. If they seen a coyote out in the field 100 yards from their pen or whatever, they would stand and watch that coyote. Their tail hairs may flare up, you know, and they just watched it and then go back to feeding or whatever they was doing. But you take a dog the same distance away, and it can be a little toy chihuahua that's this big, and those deer are flipping out. They're bouncing off the fence. Ask anybody that here that's raised captive deer, and I know we've got some guys here with captive deer. Ask them how, a deer, how those captive deer relate to dogs. It does not work. There is nothing worse than dogs. I've coon hunted when I was a kid, grew up, and it was a passion of mine as a young boy, but I would not let no coon hunter on my property. Guys, I have too much invested in my deer, and I, uh, but I'm, I agree with Don. I can go on a property that the hunters are doing everything wrong, and you'll still find deer beds. You can go on a property where the coyotes are thick, and you'll still find deer beds. You go on a property the dogs run the woods, you will not find deer beds because that deer gets chased by a dog. They can't lose it. A hunter doesn't chase down a deer, and a coyote will not chase a deer very far once it realizes it's healthy. That little dog will just chase it for fun, and once they get chased by it, they will not bet on that piece of ground. So, guys, I'm a dog lover. I have two dogs at home, and I will never not have a dog in my life, but he will not go in my deer woods. That's the truth. Okay, with Tony going first, the amount of, with the amount of hunting property available today and the amount of hunters we have, would it be possible for every hunter, every deer hunter in the Midwest to instill your strategy in his or your hunting area, and would there be enough hunting ground left for every hunter? I don't got enough time. <laughs> no, what I mean is, guys, everybody, I have never walked, here's a, an easy way of looking at this. I have never walked a property that was much more than 10 percent of its potential. Most properties, even good ones that they think they're doing a nice job, my opinion is only at about 20 percent of its potential. There are so many places to make it so much better. So guys, everybody can afford to fix up their land. That's why I constantly work on my property, because there is room for improvement. Can you repeat that question? Okay, the question is, if every hunter in the Midwest would instill your methods and, and uh, hunt the amount of property that you hunt and like to control, would there be enough hunting ground if everyone would use that method? A absolutely, because you know what? Every deer hunter wants to kill mature deer, but a very small percentage are willing to do what it takes. They're, they're not willing to let those young bucks grow. So it starts with that. If every deer hunter in North America would allow bucks to reach five and six years old, we'd all be shooting giants. So it doesn't really matter how they manage their land per se, it's how they manage their hunting and uh, you know, their harvest of the deer. Okay, we're taking Don first. Scent control is quite possibly one of the biggest money makers in the deer hunting industry today, ranging from soaps, shampoos, deodorants, chapstick, carbon camouflage, hunting clothes, ozone generators, toothpaste, and other products all claiming to help you remain scent free. Are these products a waste of money or should I use them as a valuable asset to my hunting strategy? Well, you know, interesting enough, in, sometimes in my seminars, I will ask the crowd, the question will come up about what scent control measures I, I use, and I'll ask the crowd, how many out there use some sort of scent control measure? And every hand in the crowd goes up. I, do you use a soap? Do you use a scent control clothing, sprays, whatever? If you use any of those things or one of those things, raise your hand. Every hand goes up. And then I say, how many of you have been winded by deer? Well, guess what? Every hand's still in the air. <laughs> Tells me they don't work. And I'm not saying they don't work at all. I, I think they do work to some degree. But here's the thing. Even if you could be 100% scent free, let's just assume they do work, and you could be 100% scent free, where, where the hunters miss is the wind conditions have to be such that a mature buck is comfortable getting out of his bed and moving past your stand. And for me, the only scent control measure I use is I play the wind. 
Believe it or not, I don't use spray. I, and in the past, I did everything. In the past, I did everything to the point where I carried a bottle to pee in. And one day, I looked at that thing, and I thought, you gotta be, this thing's got to stink. And I threw it in the trash. That's where it started. The next time I was deer hunting and I had to pee in my stand, guess what? I peed out of the stand, and it wasn't five minutes later. Here comes an eight-point buck, and he sticks. He comes right to where my pee was at, and he starts eating the grass. You know what? I, I've been peeing out of my tree ever since. <laughs> I, I think these, these scent control measures are a, probably a billion dollar industry and it's, it's a billion dollars wasted because even if they did work 100%, if you don't understand how deer and especially mature bucks that we're trying to target, if you don't understand how they're utilizing the wind to their advantage, then it's all lost. It doesn't matter if you're scent free. I totally disagree. I'm going to tell you right now, I watch the wind and I'm a fanatic, but I also eat alfalfa tablets starting 30 days before season, alfalfa and chlorophyll, and basically it makes you do everything green. But I'm going to tell you, here's something you should think about. When you're out in a field and there's a woodchuck stands up, all the deer will just look at it and go right back to eating. Now a tomcat walks into that field, and them does will snort at it, stomp at it, and follow. Why? It's a meat eater. And if you actually eat alfalfa and chlorophyll, and I use carbon as another thing, just 100% ground up coconut, it is deadly, it's cheap, it's only 20 bucks, and you can make a tanker truck of the best scent eliminator you can use. It still don't mean I hunt with the wind blowing towards my bucks, but if the wind changes, I've done all I can to make sure I'm okay. And I'm gonna continue to do it because I have success and I have deer all around me. My property's so little and I pack so many deer on it, that's one thing I will never change is my scent fanatic. And I'm gonna just tell you this, I grew up as a trapper. And I'm gonna tell you, I know the difference between coon urine, fox urine, all of them smell different. Everybody knows what a tomcat smells like, a mouse pee. And if you smell like a rotten buck, you need to go see a doctor. So guys, I'm just here to tell you, urine is not urine. They can tell the difference. Now, that gets misinterpreted. So guys pee in their thing. You will see when a deer walks up and smells something like that, Nine times out of ten, the first thing it'll do is lift its nose in the air to see if you're here. If the odor ain't here, then you're not in the area. That just means where you've been. So they'll backtrack you and everything, but that doesn't mean they think you're a deer. Guys, urine is not urine, and it's one of the biggest mistakes people make. I have a pee bottle, I'm telling you that, and I always will. So there's where we draw the line. I, I, at one time, like I said, I used it all too. I still got winded. I guess I just stink a lot worse than Tony does. <laughs> just remember, left side pea bottle, right side Mountain Dew. Very important. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So this is a dual question with, with Tony going first. Since the use of trail cameras was introduced years ago, Many opinions and laws have emerged and changed. Some states are now outlawing the use of them entirely. Yet many hunters feel this way is the best tactic available to them today. today. Now cell cameras have burst onto the scene. Some people feel that these types of trail cameras have crossed the lines of ethical hunting. Others feel many people actually hurt their chance of harvesting a mature buck by simply putting too much pressure on a property with installing cameras and changing batteries and swapping SD cards. Tony, what is your opinion on trail cameras and how they have impacted your success in pursuing whitetails? Well, I haven't started using cameras since just a couple of years ago because I'm a guy that believes you should learn to be a true woodsman. Everything tells you what you need to know, but the cameras are a big factor, and most hunters have learned to rely on them 100%. And, you know, all I'm saying is if you use cameras all the time, you will not learn to be a great woodsman. So you should learn to be a great woodsman and then add them as a, another feather in your hat, but they shouldn't be your sole way of hunting. And I think that they are going to change the laws because just because everything is going to change. Technology can get too advanced. 
But me, I see nothing wrong with the guy that uses a camera. Again, if it's legal, I'm all for it. I'm just me personally. I just started using them to show people the proper way of using them. And all I'm going to say, guys, you know, in the old days, everybody always said, well, they don't know them cameras. Well, everyone in here has probably been hunting. Have you ever seen a doe walk up to a tree this big and just stare at the bark? Put a camera on it, and then you get 100 pictures this close. Okay? All the years I hunted, I never seen a deer stare at the bark until you put a square box on it. So I'm here to tell you they do know what they are. But they do work if you take time, but most guys ain't going to take the time to be con control their scent. A lot of guys want to go get the chips. They ain't scent free in any way. Rubber boots have been at work. And you start going out there to take that chip out, you've done more harm going in your woods to get that little bit of information. And I'd be like Don says, basically, <laughs> don't go in there until it's time to hunt. That's how I like to hunt, too. I get everything set up, and all year long, I don't go to my stand until the day I'm going to hunt. So I leave them alone for a long time. It's my best method. You know what I appreciate about Tony's answer there was he mentioned being a woodsman first. I was blessed to grow up at a time before trail cameras, before food plots. I learned to kill deer before we had all these extra things, gadgets, gizmos, whatever you want to call them. But they came along, and I embraced the trail camera, and I'll be the first person to admit that a lot of the bucks on my wall, the bigger bucks even, are there because of trail cameras. However, I think that the vast majority of deer hunters today are doing more damage than good to their chance for success with their trail cameras. They just cannot stay away from them. They've got to run out there and they've got to pull that card. Um, they have no clue where to place them to begin with and they, they really hurt their chances. As far as the technology, you know, I, you, you got to kind of pick and choose what you're going to use and what you're not. I mean, we could uh, bash trail cameras as we're sitting there on a corn pile. Um, happens in Ohio all the time. I go over there and they, they uh, certain people want to look down on me because I'm using a trail camera while they're sitting on a pile of corn. So I guess we each have to make that decision from an ethical standpoint. Um, cell cameras are, are just a whole... Another can of worms that we could open. Um, recently, I think there's been at least two states outlaw them, and I understand that. And if if they're outlawed, um, I would embrace that. Um, not good, you're not going to hear a complaint out of me. Um, I think that uh, the good deer hunters, Tony being one of them, as well as myself, we're going to kill big deer, mature deer, every year that we want to. I mean, we sometimes we pass them. Like I didn't shoot a deer last year when I absolutely could have. But uh, we were deer hunters before these things came along. Uh, we learned the finer points. I, I really feel sorry for these younger hunters today that, you know, to them deer hunting is, is an uh, elevated blind enclosed with a propane heater of some kind in there. Out in front of that blind is a pile of corn with a trail camera on it, and, and all they do is monitor their cell phone and say, oh, I, I got one showing up in daylight, and so they go get in their heated blind and they shoot a deer. They are not woodsmen whatsoever. They don't know if, if that tree's an oak or a maple. And uh, they, they've never squirrel hunted. They've never trapped. Tony mentioned trapping, where he learned a lot of his lessons that he applies today. You know, as a, as a late teen, early 20s uh, young man, trapping was my passion. Every bit as much as deer hunting. And a lot of what I learned about reading sign, animal behavior, came from my experience as a trapper. And I just feel sorry for these young kids today that didn't grow up in that era, um, you know, to experience the things that Tony and I did growing up. Okay, this next question came from our panel, who is also here tonight sitting. They asked a question to Don Higgins. Oh, this ought to be good. They would like to know if Don is willing to team up with a highly motivated individual and show Tony how it's done on a 50-acre property in Branch County, Michigan. If I would like to... Team guess, up with a highly motivated individual and show uh, Tony, Tony... Tony is the highly motivated individual? Tony is not the highly in motivated individual. If, in other words, if you would be willing to team up with a highly motivated individual on a 50-acre property using your tactics and your methods and harvesting a 200-inch deer... 
Well, I'm not saying you're going to harvest a 200-inch deer. You, you can't control it. A mature deer and a 200-inch deer are two different things. This buck right here was 200 inches at three years old, whether people want to believe it or not. I mean, I've got his sheds from the time he was a yearling, a two-year-old, and a three-year-old. Um, that buck, as a three-year-old 200-incher, is not near as tough as one of Tony's seven-year-old bucks that grew up in Michigan. So to, to think that I could show up in Michigan on a 50-acre property and grow a 200-inch deer is ludicrous. Now, could I show up to Michigan and grow a mature deer on 50 acres? Absolutely. And, Tony, you get the same question. Would you team up with an individual in Don Higgins' backyard, basically in, in um, Shelby County, Illinois, and show Don that there's a better method in, in his home? Well, I think Don's doing pretty good. <laughs> but the point is, I mean, we all can – my system will work in Don's area. Don's system will work in mine. But we can't grow something that don't grow in that area. Genetics is a factor, age and genetics. So I doubt if I ever have a kid if he's going to be seven foot tall and blue eyes. Okay? Uh, so guys, it, it's, it's called life. But can we grow in each other's area and be successful? No doubt. Okay? But can he grow a 200 inch where there ain't really 200 inches? No. And if I go there, it'd be unlimited to what it is, but I'd be successful. Whatever the buck's in the area, I could grow a mature buck just like he could in my back of woods. Okay, we're, we're wrapping up. We have three right now, more Now, is that questions. property for sale next to Don's? <laughs> <laughs> no, that's, not, that's another story. We'll talk later. It's very expensive. <laughs> <laughs> we, have, we have three more questions. You each get your two minutes. Do you, Don being first, do you feel that politics are affecting the hunting industry and what is a negative trend that you see happening in this industry today? Well, absolutely, politics are affecting everything we do. Uh, it, it's a perfect example happened to me today. Right across from my booth is a, an outfitter from Saskatchewan, a, a bear outfitter. I'm not taking a vaccine to go bear hunting. I'm sorry, but I'm just not going to do it. So there's a perfect example of how politics is affecting hunting. Tony? There's politics in everything. And it's sad. Because really when the woods, there shouldn't be. But I'm going to tell you, laws, regulations are made by mostly non-hunters. So guys, we all better do our deal and vote for the people that basically loves our guns and the things we love. And I think too many people... And I'm going to get in trouble here. There's a lot of Democrats that vote for Democrats, and yet the people in Washington do not have the same interests. They may be a guy that hunts and has guns, but who are they electing? People that want all our stuff. So, guys, I just don't know how you can vote against somebody and be a deer hunter, and the people that we're putting in Washington hate us, literally hate us. So, to me, we all need to look at individuals and make sure we're putting the people that believe in what we believe amen <laughs> okay tony going first what are the positive trends that you see in the industry today well when i started out and i'm sure don's going to agree with this when we started out and i passed on a deer and i'd say yeah i passed on a buck today the guy would walk away. What a liar. <laughs> well, guys, it came slow for us guys that wanted big bucks. But you know what? Now you get young kids that won't shoot a deer that their dad says, take that. And they're like, no, it ain't big enough. Guess what? The world is changing, and people are getting to be better and more selective. And that's positive. And then the other thing is, all we got to do is look in this room. People come here for one reason management they didn't come here for nothing but to figure out how to make their little piece of the pie better and that before if we did this 25 years ago there wouldn't be nobody in here but me and don standing up here so it has changed tremendous slow but it's changing and i'm proud of it okay we, we're gonna wrap this up don will get four minutes and then tony will get four minutes and that will be the last of the remarks. There will be no more. 
So, Don going first, you have four minutes to sum up and conclude this debate tonight. Well, you know, I, I've stood here this evening a couple times listening to Tony talk, and I've, I've kind of wondered, how did such a simple country boy like me end up on this stage with uh, a whitetail legend? Um, Tony basically uh, is a pioneer uh, as far as whitetail consulting goes. He opened the door for me to chase my dreams. And I'd like to share a story about how Tony and I first met. I mean, you guys see us up here tonight. There was people that thought we don't like each other. Um, but this story is pretty interesting. I was uh, probably about 15 years ago, I was approached by a gentleman in Michigan who wanted to be a business partner. And I'm not going to mention his name, but uh, this person was uh, familiar with Tony. Uh, knew him on a... a pretty close level, and, and I didn't know Tony really at all. I'd seen, you know, articles about him in North American Whitetail and such, and uh, I, I didn't know much about him at all, but this person kept telling me what a terrible person Tony LaPratt was, just what a dirtbag this guy is, and, and you know, I, I just assumed he must have, he had a firsthand experience, he must have been telling the truth, you know, and there was probably a couple times that, that Tony's name came up in discussions that I was involved in, and, and you know, I, I just kind of repeated what I was told and, and uh, shouldn't have. I shouldn't have rushed to judgment, but I did. And the, the, the person that told me these things about Tony eventually sh showed his true colors. Today, he's one of these guys that's out there telling people that I turn loose captive deer. He's telling people that I've got a friend in Michigan or Wisconsin that brings captive deer down to turn loose. Well, so we had a falling out. Um, basically, it, it was about integrity and character. I, I just couldn't uh, yoke myself to someone like that in business or even personally. Um, so we separated and went, went our different ways. And then I was at a show I was asked to speak at right out here when the mech was out here on the state line, right by Sturgis, I believe it was. I was asked to speak at a show there one, one year. Um, it was the Michiana show. And I'm in my booth, and uh, up walks Tony LaPratt. And he's got this other gentleman with him. And Tony introduces th this person to me and said, Don, this is so-and-so. He came by my booth, and he had a question about trees. And I told him that you know a lot more about trees than I do because had, I had a tree business at that time. And uh, Tony introduced us and walked off. And that really hit me pretty hard because... You know, here's a guy that I've been bashing, and if the, if the roles had been reversed, I probably wouldn't have been near as nice to him as he was to me, but Tony revealed his heart to me when he did that, and as I've got to know him in the, in the number of years since then, I, I found, I, we're, we're going to disagree a lot on, on dear things, and I mean, some things we're going to disagree a whole lot, but one thing about Tony is, I, as I've got to know his heart, I've got to know his character. And uh, I'll consider him, I consider him a friend today. I have for several years, and I will continue to consider him a friend. But what he showed me at, at that time spoke volumes about his integrity. And I just thought it was worth sharing that story with the audience tonight. And he apologized, and I accept it. And Don is a great man. And uh, guys, we're all human. And um, I made mistakes in my life. And you know what? I said, just said to everybody, he just don't know who I am. You know what? You can't let bad people make you be a bad person. That's as simple as it is. So me and Don are going to be friends for a long time. In fact, to be the truth of the matter, I told him back there we should throw some chairs against the thing, throw some dirt out underneath the curtain while we're back there so people think we're going at it. <laughs> <laughs> but you know the truth is? Me and Don should be the kind of guys that go out and have a beer and a steak dinner once in a while because guess what? It's hard to find two guys that have the passion we have and the respect that we show each other. And guys, I'm going to wrap it up pretty quick. I don't need very long because it's as simple as this. Everything I ever wanted in life is standing in front of me today. I got my family, my wife. I got good people here. I got to live the life I wanted to live. I'm, I'm enjoying the dream. It don't get any better. It's called America, and let's make sure we keep it, okay? Thank you. You've been a great audience. God bless, everyone.
Do you want to take your deer hunting success to the next level? Do you want to take your hunting property to the ultimate level? Don Higgins Whitetail Master Academy is a one-of-a-kind source of cutting-edge information to help whitetail hunters and land managers become more successful. By joining Don Higgins Whitetail Master Academy, you'll see first-hand video presentations on designing real hunting properties. You'll see Don's actual tree stand locations where he has harvested giant bucks and hear him dissect these stand sites. Today we're going to feature one of my favorite tree stands. So let me set the stage for you here. This stand is located along the west side. You'll also learn hunting tactics specifically targeting mature bucks. This is the most in-depth resource online for hunting mature whitetail deer. Sign up today to unlock Don's secrets to success in the whitetail woods.